Thank you so much for being here. All right, thank you, Grant, and thank you, Sebastian, for this opportunity. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is something that's uh, fairly unique. Uh, it is a slice of history, and it is a uh, <clears throat> walk down memory lane, if you will. But I want to, uh, at the end of my presentation, tie this full circle to where we are right now with an emphasis on the idea that uh, everything old is new again. My own background is um, retired Army Special Operations Officer, uh, retired from the State Department working on the chemical biological treaties, working on tactical nuclear weapons, uh, working in a reciprocal stint with the NSC on certain other issues, and um, lucky enough to spend some time in the intelligence community as well. Uh, this is an area of interest to me for a lot of reasons, not just because I was involved in it, but because it's very much an important issue today. Uh, it is not just the theoretical and not just the academic part of this that should capture your attention, but the fact that this Cold War war game, if you will, nuclear war game more specifically, is a deep dive into crisis decision making, dealing with strategic uncertainty, uh, looking at deterrent policy, and trying to determine what looks like victory in a so called winnable nuclear exchange. Before I go on to the first slide, I just want to set the context that um, this was a real world issue. Uh, during the Cold War, when the two main protagonists were the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, we were busy about the issue of looking out at each other's activities, trying to estimate what the other person would do, uh, trying to think about what things they would do, large and small, overt and covert, to put a finger in our eye and we in theirs. It was a regular seven day a week, 24 hour a day campaign. It didn't let up. So when we talk about nuclear war game design, we have to recognize the context is this arose during the height of the Cold War. And like many games in the military context, you learn as much by losing as you do by winning. But in the back of your mind, you're always thinking about when will I have to apply this kind of thinking to a real world situation where we don't get up, go to the bathroom, visit with our friends and go home for the evening. This is very different, this is real. This is getting you ready for something that's pretty nasty and pretty deadly. The context also is that we lived in a time in hair trigger risks of interpreting the threats that we saw and of trying to deter the threats that we thought we saw. We were concerned about making decisions that made sense in the short term and the long term. We had to be ever aware of the geopolitical realities of that era which is 1980 to 1988, we had to be very aware of the accidental and provocative risks that existed on both sides. We were truly in a MAD environment, a mad environment, mutually assured destruction. And history will show, for those of you who have already studied this, there have been several close calls, going back, of course, to the Cuban Missile Crisis, among others, where miscalculation, misinterpretation of events could have been catastrophic. We always had the deal during the eight year period that I'm talking about with the grim reality about our respective nuclear arsenals. We had to also deal with the fact that there was a certain degree of ambiguity in our actions. There was a certain degree of risk involved in 
knowing what the best course of action was, which implies that you have considered all plausible courses of action and you have in fact selected the best one. And we also knew in when engaging in these games that you'd be paying the price for ignoring events, failing to recognize key events, or misinterpreting those events. And finally, before I go to slide one, you have to keep in mind that we were trying to prepare leaders, senior leaders, for a true, genuine uh, exchange of nuclear weapons with the idea of trying to control that, but also manage it. And so the final thing that we had to worry about was something we call mirror imaging. If you know what mirror imaging is, sorry, my slides are not moving ahead. Maybe I can get some help on that. Hey, uh, Robert, try pressing on the on the slide deck presentation in yeah. point and then try doing that. Oh, there it goes. Okay, got it. Thank you. So mirror imaging is in effect saying that I think my opponent will act just the way I do, invoke the same logic, invoke the same considerations, be affected by the same parameters and sense of risk. And that's a dangerous thing to do. <clears throat> So in this context of preparing senior leaders for the possibility of nuclear exchange, we had to recognize that <clears throat> there were genuine tripwire risks and there was also genuine accidental risk and provocative risk, and I'll talk about those in a minute. In those eight years, there were over 31,000 nuclear warheads in play between the two sides. On the United States side, we were very concerned about communist hegemony, the acquisition of territory, and the persistence of the threat. Both sides possessed what we call the nuclear triad, which is displayed on the first slide. That is nuclear capable submarines, nuclear delivery aircraft, and long range nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles. The Cold War context went for 45 years and included espionage, propaganda, disinformation, efforts to try to scare or <clears throat> misdirect the other side. That era included, at a personal level, assassinations and coups and proxy wars, wars in Angola, for example, wars in Vietnam. These were all against the background of the larger reality, which is nuclear parity that existed between the US and the Soviet Union. We were keenly aware of the risk of decapitation. Decapitation meaning that it was very real to expect that a nuclear submarine could sit off the coast of Martha's Vineyard, launch a surprise single missile attack on military and civilian headquarters in the span of 11 minutes and wipe out the command control and communication responsible for directing the US military and our NATO allies. With that was the cold question against that background of the existence of the allies in the Warsaw Pact and the fact that we in intercontinental ballistic missile terms were 20 minutes to oblivion. It took 20 minutes time to target from an ICBM launch at any one of many sites in the Soviet Union and several of ours to reach their intended targets. We retained fail safe zones, which are places where, for example, our bombers could linger before getting direction. And if you ever saw the, the movie Crimson Tide, which involved Gene Hackman and a couple of other people, it's an interesting movie to see. That illustrates the problem of when you have nuclear equipped submarines operating in the ocean, ready to deliver their deadly cargo, but are likely to make decisions on their own when they do not, repeat, do not hear from Washington, to assure them that Washington is still there. And this also presumed that we had crisis recall authority. I mention all this by way of context <clears throat> 
because in preparing people for nuclear war, the realities, the detail, the requirements, uh, and all of the uh, imperatives and demands were operating simultaneously. This is just a thumbnail sketch of the considerations that went into preparing senior leadership teams for this eventuality. The conflict scenario that we faced during the Cold War in those eight years in particular, uh, rival superpowers each equipped with significant nuclear weaponry and significant standing armies. We did not have, as we have today, other nuclear powers or other armies of any magnitude or significance that we had to worry about. If anything, by having a paired set of strategic opponents, we kept a lot of things under control because we were acutely aware that if something slipped out of control, that it could lead to further escalation and further conflict. So part of the training, part of the gaming that we did, a very important part of the gaming was to acquaint people with some of these tripwire scenarios that if they were not managed properly, could lead to a wider nuclear war, or at least to the brink of nuclear war, very difficult to back away from. So as you see on this map, which is just an illustrative map, you can see some of the flashpoints that occurred during that period, not all of them, certainly. And there were several skirmishes, what I'm calling skirmishes, there were things that happened that could have escalated into a situation where uh, the consideration of nuclear exchange could have occurred. And all along in the game that we designed and in the scenarios that we built, we had to build into that the risk of misreading signals, of interpreting signals, of making a distinction between uh, provocative risks that we saw and accidental risks. Provocative risks were those things that an opponent did in one of these regional theaters, which may have caused us to be suspicious about their ultimate intentions. For example, 1965 in Indonesia, Another film that you might want to see, The Year of Living Dangerously, illustrates this. When uh, there was a risk of a communist coup in Indonesia, and the concern was that the exploitation of that coup and the leadership involved there could uh, play out of control and lead to further escalation that could not be curtailed and could not be uh, rolled back. The, concept that we wanted to leave our senior leaders with was think about the tripwire, think about the specific action by our enemy that would cause you to even want to think about getting your finger closer to the button. And that was very important in trying to bring realis realism to the games that we were playing. Uh, there were many instances of that on this map are just a few illustrated. And I think history shows that uh, the ones that were the most risky, for example, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62, included a number of hidden elements that neither side knew about. Uh, years after the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, we found in direct meetings with Russian leadership that something called relief authority was granted to the field nuclear commanders in Cuba. Now, release authority means that in the world of nuclear weapons where there's nuclear parity, release authority means that you have delegated the right to use nuclear weapons below your senior most leader level to operational unit or theater commanders to use at their discretion. Even if that release authority included only what we call tactical nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons being different from strategic weapons, 
and the tactical weapons have a smaller footprint of damage from the strategic weapons. But even with that delegation of authority, there was a risk of miscalculation. For example, in Cuba, we found out much to our surprise and chagrin that release authority had been granted by the Soviet leadership to two of the senior military commanders were controlling uh, the emplacement of missiles in Cuba. And the particular missile systems they have, which I don't want to go into, but you can read about this, uh, were of the tactical nature and could have inflicted not only devastating harm on their targets, but could have been interpreted by anyone on the US side as the beginning of an all out nuclear war. And it's the scenario of that kind which illustrates a situation where the protagonists, the US and the Soviet Union, were literally on hair trigger alert and very, very suspicious about each other's motives. When we eventually persuaded uh, the Soviets to uh, withdraw their missiles by ship, what was hidden in history was that uh, a secret part of the deal that later was revealed is uh, removing some of our own missiles from northern Turkey, uh, Jupiter missiles that we had that were aimed at the Soviet Union. So while you look at this and you look at what history says, while you're living it, while you're going through it, while you're trying to process the immediate and long-term downstream consequences of your immediate decision, uh, you recognize that you're dealing with something that has a true life and death uh, significance. And so in training senior leaders who had the capacity to make decisions about our military, about our diplomatic forces, about the conduct of our security situation, it was extremely important that we put people in situations that as far as we knew, could replicate the kinds of scenarios they would, they would face. <clears throat> now, jumping ahead to the current time, uh, what complicates things and would make nuclear gaming these days much more difficult are, are basically four basic facts. Fact number one is we're no longer just two uh, strategic nuclear actors, the US and Russia. On the left, you have the projected number, estimated number of nuclear warheads on both sides. Notice the US and Russia have over 4,000. Notice the other nuclear members of the club. When we played this game during the 80s, there were only two major nuclear powers we had to worry about. And they were able to restrict and control behavior on the globe because of their nuclear capabilities. However, uh, now that we face a situation where we have 10 and ultimately may have two more nuclear powers, <clears throat> even though some of those nuclear powers may have a limited number of weapons, the whole calculus of designing a game, which includes the full expanse of strategic options, alternatives, immediate and downstream consequences has changed dramatically. There's no longer a situation of geostrategic nuclear parity. Um, the whole idea of mutual assured destruction is still there, but this time, what makes this different today, what makes it more difficult today to run a game is the behavior of the other nuclear actors is going to be much different than the way we did it during the Cold War. For example, with India and Pakistan literally sharing a border, we have no way of knowing whether their systems will be sufficient curb on the control of misread, miscalculated intentions. And by the time you figure out that those intentions may be wrong, it may be too late. Now, even in our Cold War days, 
And as a result of those Cold War days, we had a hotline, a so-called hotline. It was direct from the Russian Ministry of Defense to our, <clears throat> to our own headquarters. And it was a way of ensuring that leaders could talk to each other. Uh, no such hotline like that exists, for example, between the different parties outside of the US and Russia. So the main thing that I want to leave you with is that uh, while we put a premium on realism, and while we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money getting people ready for nuclear exchanges and nuclear combat between two major powers, the whole calculus of preparing people for the nuclear risk environment today is entirely different and presents an entirely different challenge of a multidimensional nature. It's hard to contemplate. So in our design issues, the variables we looked at, the things that we had to consider every time we did a game was to put as much realism as we could, as much stress as we could, as many strategic dilemmas as we could, make sure that we were testing deterrence policy and that we were introducing uncertainty. We weren't trying to play with people's brains, weren't trying to tamper with their imagination, we weren't trying to scare them to death, but we were walking them through a variety of different situations where even the smallest decision might have ramifications of an unknown nature down the road, which could change the geopolitical balance, could be interpreted by the other side as an aggressive form of behavior. All those things were included. And we built in as much real world ground truth data as we could in strategic decision making. The people involved in these games were brief, prepared, and their teams had their hands on all capabilities of the systems they had, and to the extent possible, our knowledge of the capabilities of the other side. We had our best estimates of how other leader, leaders would behave and the courses of action we thought they had, being aware of mirror imaging and the danger of that. We got in people involved in extended free play, and I can't go into detail, but it wasn't a case where people sat at their desk for a couple of hours, went home and ate a tuna fish sandwich and went to bed with their loved ones. We had them uh, very stressed out for an extended period of time, 24 hours a day. And we limited the injects to the things we felt were relevant to move things along, but enough of the calamity and the uncertainty associated with this scenario uh, it was its own driver. There was a certain degree of uncertainty as there is in real life about the intelligence that you have, how accurate is it? How timely is it? How complete is it? Uh, what does the intelligence tell you about existing enemy behavior and existing enemy options? How revelatory is it? How eye-opening is it about expected enemy behavior? given changes in circumstances. And the moves, quote unquote, that, that happened here was not a case where the controller stepped in and said, okay, now it's move one, now we go to move two. Once we opened the floodgates and started with the scenario, the people were off and running. There wasn't a discernible distinction between move one, move two, and move three. It just rolled on with a heavy dose of reality and continue that way until the end of the game was declared by the controller. Everything was free play, everything was interactive and everything was unscripted. We did have a red cell of experts who were there to play the opposition. We did have people playing our NATO allies. We did have people playing disinterested international global partners. And if you were the US team, you had to pay attention to all that. You were gonna certainly pay more attention to the Soviet leadership than you would to NATO and more attention to NATO than you would 
with what someone from Ethiopia or Argentina thought. But that's the way the game was structured as realistic as possible. Real-time messaging, logging, and interpretation of messages became crucial. People realized very quickly that if they were too sloppy, too incomplete, not timely, not accurate, not comprehensive in noting what happened, uh, other people could misinterpret that. Other people would be looking for you to explain. Uh, many instances were, for example, a particular senior game player, when they finished their shift and they were tired and they had to do a handoff briefing to the replacement. If that person would go to crash on their bed and they'd be awakened two hours later because they didn't adequately explain a certain note in their log about what happened, to have it interpreted properly. So there was always the need to pay attention to those things listed here, uh, to, to be aware of the risk of surprise, strategic surprise, especially when the enemy displayed a form of armament we had never seen before, or tried to do something in the conflict scenario that we were not expecting. Uh, we were always asking our players to keep an eye on what was happening within the NATO alliance, wanting to know specifically the extent to which our alliance was with us and how they were behaving and whether they were staying together or being influenced by Soviet behavior designed to split the alliance in the midst of a crisis. We always were aware of, and it was always difficult to keep a handle on, the question of tactical nuclear weapons. There was much looser control and accountability of those tactical nuclear weapons than there were for the accountable warheads that both parties had. And we were very concerned about the nuclear forces, the triad, the submarines, the planes, and the missile commands, making sure they had C3, that is command, control, and communications, always. That it was non unbroken and uninterrupted. As you can see today, this would be very difficult because of cyber hacking, the, the dependence we have on technology, and things of that nature. Another key issue in terms of building in realism and stress, strategic dilemmas, was the question of retaliation. And the, question of choosing targets. Back in those days, we had something called counter force and counter value targets. A counter force target was a military installation or a target of military value. A counter force target was a city. Uh, and so when people thought about the possibility of dozens and dozens of nuclear weapons being dropped on the United States and us dropping them on the Soviet Union, we had a mixture of counterforce and countervalue targets. It was a horrible, unbelievable, but nonetheless a very realistic and very pragmatic way of planning the reality we were dealing with. We also threw in where we could vague, deceptive, misleading, and incomplete messages to reflect the kind of propaganda and distraction we thought that arise in the middle of this crisis. So the essentials that were built into the game, and we spent a lot of time building these essentials, were scenario details. And we asked people not to fight the scenario, we asked people to accept the scenario as given, that with its ambiguities and with its uncertainties, that you would just hit the ground running, like the beginning of a horse race, when they open those gates and the horses jump out at the same time, we wanted people to pay attention to team dynamics. Were team leaders listening to their advisors? Were team leaders in different areas of specialization consulting with others? Were people trying to avoid being a one-man band? Were they working a collaborative joint environment that we had created for them? Uh, were they updating themselves? on the situation, on the threat posture of the different interests, the US and the Soviets. And so the way we built the scenario is that we interpreted 
we ask them to interpret up for actions, up for options as opposing forces, opposing forces actions, opposing forces options, and opposing force reactions, and do that in a realistic, timely, time sensitive way. The handoff briefings were critical. When people ended a 10 hour shift or an eight to 10 hour shift, as the case may be, and you have the shift from 10 o'clock at night till six the next morning, you better hope that you got all the material that you needed to have to be able to sit in that chair, make the decisions you had to make and interpret the activities that are going on and make sure there wasn't a single message or a single tasker, a single requirement that was being neglected or forgotten. The pressure that we placed on people was gradual and it was increasing and we wanted to make it overwhelming because we thought that's how it would be. Anyone out there in the audience right now who's ever worked in a task force where you're working seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you know the kind of dynamic I'm talking about. A good exercise, a well-designed exercise must replicate that stress environment. You cannot let your players off the hook, especially if you want them to grasp uh, the nonstop pressure that the environment has created. We wanted them to pursue escalation, de-escalation options. And we wanted them to make sure they knew the nuclear arsenal and capabilities of all the combatants. And we also wanted to help train them on what they thought uh, could deter the enemy in certain areas and which deterrence actions would in turn could be interpreted as provocative. So, uh, another movie you must see, of course, is Dr. Strangelove by Stanley Kubrick, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Um, great movie, uh, done to make a parody of nuclear planning, and certainly worth the effort and the time to see it. But the focus, again, on realistic game design, strategic competition, was we wanted people to understand what the consequences of bad decisions or poorly formulated decisions and mistakes could be, as well as the cost of inaction and miscalculation. By throwing, these are some of the scenario differences here. Each of the different games that we did started off with these different kinds of situations. Uh, a decapitation strike led one game, a counter four strike led another, a rogue commander with an SS-18 or a road mobile SS-25-27 uh, would launch without authority. An internal coup by the GRU, which is the Russian military, an accidental launch, an, a renegade Yankee or Oscar-class sub that you couldn't reach, a bear bomber that couldn't be recalled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, we tried to build those different scenario variabilities because we wanted to build a rich flavor of integrated thinking so people could have a realistic grasp of the variety of crazy things that could happen to them when they're sitting in that chair. Now, oversight and management of the game was left to the controllers, coordinators, uh, and uh, particularly the game designers. The controllers were always nuclear experts, the coordinators were defense experts, the site managers were agency policy experts, and the evaluators were the same. In order to make it realistic, we had people away from home. We had people in a situation where none of the creature comforts that you would expect to see, like an ordinary TV set or an ordinary radio or anything communication with the outside world was completely removed. They were in a closed cocoon environment of simulated reality that we created. They were in isolation for a certain number of days to further en enhance the stress. The red team experts we had were those who had studied and knew as best we could determine Soviet behavior and Russian leadership behavior experts in Russian and NATO affairs. If there was the rare time when we had to stop the game 
we would only stop the game for two reasons. Number one, uh, there was an example of a real-time uh, emergency of some sort involving the game players that required us to stop the game and resume it. The other one is a stop action where uh, a precipitous decision was made either by Soviet side or by the US side that was obviously going to lead into some cataclysmic re reaction or response. We stopped for a few minutes to discuss whether we felt the players, both in the red cell and the playing team felt that this was an irrevocable decision, one that they had to live with and one that they felt they could explain to anyone who wanted to ask later. There was no adjudication in the middle of the game. No one jumped in and said, oh, you're doing that wrong, or oh, I think you've made a mistake here. Oh, you've read that message wrong, or you're not considering all the alternatives. We did not adjudicate during the game. At the end of the game, there was a lot of discussion and adjudication by experts, but not during the game at all. We wanted people to deliberate and decide as a group. We wanted to force the team dynamics that replicated the crisis event. When we compare it to the 62 Cuban Missile Crisis where Kennedy created what he called an XCOM of advisors, when you go back and look through the entrails of that and you realize how limited their inputs of information were, how many things they were blind to, how many things were subject to misinterpretation, how many opportunities for error existed, it would boggle your brain. So we wanted to build into this highly stressful game that the interpretation of events, the validation of message traffic, uh, the the idea of tracking important messages, following what happens with your allies in the region was all very important. And the split shift dynamics of handoff were extremely important to that event. We limited our wildcard injects to very few, if any. And we spent time at the end of the game very rigorously going over with the players what we call taskers, that is things you had to do as a tasker, requirements that you had that arose in the game that you, that you, we called orphan, an orphan tasker. In other words, something you were expected to do that you forgot to do, or you delayed doing it, or you misinterpreted and you didn't assign it the priority it deserved. And then we also talk in the hot wash, which is at the end of the game, the hot wash is a big plenary discussion of what we went through. The hot wash would talk about any gaps, any blind spots, ambiguities, and strategic reflection on uh, what was done and what mistakes were made. We weren't there to point fingers. We were there to highlight dynamics that we felt could, in a real crisis situation, lead us down a path that was dangerous or ill-conceived. We also tried very hard in this exercise to gain deterrence theory. Before I talk about deterrence theory, there was something that we had built into our nuclear systems called an always never, always never system. Always never meant that our nuclear systems would always work when we wanted to, wanted them to, and would never work when we didn't want them to. We never had the assurance that the Soviets had an always never system. Today, when we think about the 10 nuclear powered states, we can be fairly certain they do not have an always never system, which means that their command control, their military civilian leadership that makes life and death decisions about the use of their nuclear arsenals uh, will depend almost entirely on what a human being decides to do or not do. So in deterrence theory, we're looking at behavior, specific behavior. There was a lot of deterrence theory that was out in the public domain that was being discussed, that was receiving serious academic consideration and serious geopolitical military consideration. Deterrence theory basically is, what are the things that I must do in order to prevent my enemy? Hey, Robert, you're fading out. Can you come closer to the mic? Sure. 
Deterrence theory means what can I do to make sure that my enemy is prevented from taking action that will be inimical to my interests? What can I do to cause my enemy to think twice about doing X, Y, or Z? Deterrence theory is also about putting uh, provocative roadblocks in the way of your enemy that are not attacks, but are very serious dilemmas you present to them that will cause them to think about whether they're going to escalate or de-escalate a situation where their finger is on the button. And this is all based on the idea that in the game, we wanted people to be absolutely aware of and never forget the mutual vulnerability issue. That is that whoever was in charge uh, was vulnerable to being detected and being destroyed. And we also were very aware of the fact that we were forcing people to think about how much is enough. People were aware of Carl Sagan's theory of nuclear winter. Any of you have read Carl Sagan's theory? His theory was something less than 20 nuclear weapons exchange would create an, a nuclear winter and a, an amount of radiation flowing throughout the atmosphere across the globe that would render life generally uninhabitable or un, untenable for anywhere from 25 to 35 years, maybe more. So deterrence theory was also concerned about teaching these people what can we do? What can we say? What is it that we can signal to the other side that will avert further war or avert further escalation? And what can we do that would create options that are too deadly or costly for the other side so that they don't feel backed into a corner and they feel that they have options to invoke? Because if, they, if the enemy is backed into a corner and figures it only has the doomsday weapon to invoke, game over. And this also was important to teach our leadership what constituted checkmate conditions. It also begged the question of what constituted victory. So we acknowledged wild cards existed, but we kept them to an absolute minimum because we're dealing with very high level people, very senior people, who know what their agency can do, who know what the capabilities of their systems are. And we tried to limit the wild cards to the ones listed here. That is, one wild card that always worried us was the possibility of tactical nuclear weapons being used. The possibility of what we call asymmetric escalation. That is, the other side would misread what you did or try to play chicken with you and cause you to escalate beyond a point of reasonableness where you found yourself to begin with. The MIRV is the multiple independent re-entry vehicle. The Russians developed something, rail and road mobile platforms that enable them to move their strategic missiles anywhere they wanted in the country. If you remember during the Iraq war, there was a, a great game called let's find the SCUD and let's destroy the SCUD missile sites. Well, if the SCUDs were in one place and you could find them, you could knock them out. But if the SCUDs were movable on the back of a truck or somewhere else, you couldn't destroy them. And so the lingering risk of continued escalation was there. Today, we have to worry about hypersonic weapons and how long it actually takes a launch missile to reach its target. We have to be concerned about the existence of neutron weapons, which people laughed at, said, that's crazy. Who wants a neutron weapon? A neutron weapon kills people and leaves the building intact. We had to prepare ourselves for leakers. Very famous briefing we had <clears throat> from the Israeli Defense Forces about the reign of missiles that came into Israel during the Gulf War revealed that there's a phenomenon called leakers. Leakers are those missiles that make it through your air defense system. You don't, you can't, when someone fires 25 missiles at you, you can't shoot down all 25. Seven or eight will get through and they will kill people. 
And the question is, what do you do about the leaker problem? And another wild card is second strike. If you have thousands of weapons, are you going to use them all? Are you going to use a few? Are you going to hold any in reserve? And today, we would have to worry about additional nuclear enhancement options, such as satellite-based lasers. Uh, lasers, I'm sorry. So the whole question of wild cards had to be considered. And by choice, we limited those to two or three because they were just too disruptive and threatened to destroy what we were trying to achieve in the way of building collegial skills and analytical skills in the senior leaders. What we learned from previous nuclear crises are, are many things. Uh, these are just some of the nuclear crises where there was a risk of misinterpretation in nuclear exchange, owing to faulty computer systems or accidental launches of missiles that were not nuclear in nature. All these things we've talked about uh, tonight to some extent. And the arms control treaties that we had, the INF treaty, the STAR treaty, the Moscow treaty, these are all designed to back us away farther and farther from the brink of where we would use these missiles in anger toward each other. And so I would invite you to take a closer look at some of these nuclear crises, including some of the ones where nuclear bombs were carried on planes and planes crashed with their nuclear materials. But uh, the number one thing on this slide I'd like you to realize that I've put at the bottom is looking ahead to the future, using lessons from this era to look at the future. When you add the Internet of Things and and artificial intelligence and quantum, along with the 10 nuclear players, you have a very mixed, very complicated, very difficult strategic environment and scenario. So aside from the fact that everybody who went through this process, everybody who went through the training, and everybody who was exposed to these serial uh, dramatic events and exercises, Everyone who went through that had a keener appreciation for the massive responsibilities that they had for protecting American society, for defending our interests, for dealing realistically with a nuclear equipped enemy. Despite all that, you had to reckon with the key question, and that is what constitutes victory? When we played this over and over again, we came up with at least eight possible outcomes. You can read these, but this is the sobering reality we drew over eight years of running these games and running our players into the ground with these games. Both sides can inflict catastrophic damage on each other and to the world. Both sides absorb some limited nuclear exchange, but the conflict is frozen. Nobody else wants to lob any missiles. We stop where we are and we try to rebuild. Both sides absorb an, a nuclear exchange and they retain a second strike option, sitting on a hair trigger wondering whether a second strike is necessary. Another outcome is one side absolutely destroys the other conclusively and survives the exchange with most of their society and many of their political, military, and economic resources intact. Another outcome was both sides launch a first wave strike, reserve the second wave capability, but the difference between that and number three is that on number five, the second wave capability is a given. We know that a second wave will be necessary to respond. And, and scenario three, Second strike is something that causes you to de-escalate, to back away from further damage, even though you know the capabilities there. Scenario five, we have to bite the bullet and assume a second wave is certainly possible. Scenario six is one side executes a surprise attack and decapitates the enemy and achieves uh, a kind of a victory that is not 
catastrophic in nature, but certainly strategic. Uh, another scenario is efforts at de-escalation and recall fail. And so there's a limited nuclear exchange, uh, people are killed, there's no turning back, we can't wave off the risk of a second wave and a compensatory attack follows by both sides. And then the eighth scenario is a limited surgical strike involving a few weapons, the other side backs down and surrenders. Now there's probably other outcomes, but these are the ones that we spent time training a leader for. So my question at the conclusion is, what do we do about 2020 and beyond, given that we're no longer in a world where we only had two rival nuclear powers who could destroy each other? Nuclear conflict now is very complicated. Therefore, the definition of how it be managed will be very complicated. Definition of how you prepare leadership for it, very complicated, very difficult. And it begs the question of what does victory look like now compared to even back then? That's it for me. Okay, well, thank you so much, Professor McCray. That was uh, quite interesting, and you actually got <laughs> quite a few questions waiting for you. Um, so I'm going to uh, actually start a little bit at the more recent questions, because I know, um, uh, who is it? Um, Kieran just, Kieran, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pronounce your last name correctly, Lakarajou, uh, had a question on uh, slide 13, the, um, the eight possible outcomes. Um, yeah. And just asked, do you have a rough idea on the distribution of outcomes over the games that you ran? I do, but I can't talk about it. Fair enough. Um, and uh, um, so Stephen Downs Martin, Mar Martin had asked, uh, how was adjudication done in those games? Um, like, were the outcomes of interacting protagonist decision, or sorry, how were the outcomes of interacting protagonist decisions decided? Well, as I said earlier, there was very limited adjudication. Uh, we had to deal with three things. That is, what did you decide to do during this game? Number two, can we discuss the consequences of your decisions? Number three, what would you have done differently if you had it to do over again? That was the only adjudication we did. Now, we would have at the margins we would have told people well you missed this opportunity you had this you had this element of uh, the warsaw pack waving a white flag surrendering their weapons in the middle of this and you didn't pay attention to that um what were we supposed to do with that that kind of thing and just a follow-up i know sebastian had just asked um why was there limited adjudication again uh reasons I can't go into, uh, the number one reason I can say is we were dealing with very, very senior people. And very senior people don't take instruction well. They may take the ideas home with them. They may think about what it all means in the greater context of life. But uh, many of them, uh, let's just say, leave it where I said it. Got it. So I'm going to uh, go back to some of the earlier questions that we had. Um, and one of the first ones, uh, Sebastian had asked, do you have a specific nuclear game that you've designed and can discuss its core design elements in terms of mechanics? Well, I have one, I have one that's sort of uh, available for graduate school discussion. It does cover a 24-hour uh, period broken into several three or four hour segments. So yeah, I do. And uh, James Griffin asked, how much weight are the um, dynamics in nuclear exchange models given in nuclear war gaming? <clears throat> sorry, could you repeat that, Grant? I could just sure. get over it. Sorry, sorry, I, I coughed during that. Uh, so how much weight are the uh, dynamic nuclear exchange models given in nuclear war gaming? Nuclear exchange models. 
I'm not sure I understand the question very well. Um, we can move on. Uh, James, James Griffin, I, it's possible I just butchered that question. If you could, could clarify in the chat, um, that would be great. I, I know he had a, a separate question, uh, which was, to your knowledge, uh, how much did nuclear wargaming factor into the choices made in uh, PSYOP? Oh, in PSYOP? Well, that's outside the boundaries of what I'm talking about. But I think there were PSYOP elements in these games. There were deliberate efforts to include disinformation, propaganda, active measures, which were ongoing during those eight years anyway. They were intermingled with other tasks and other messages. Great, and I know um, uh, James Starrett just asked a question, um, just because you mentioned uh, grad school. For, for uh, those of the participants trying to teach nuclear strategy in a classroom, what games that are available to the public would you suggest um, using? Well, I'd have to give a lot of thought to that because that's a stumper. I'm not aware of any. Uh, as far as I know, the one that I have sitting in a drawer over here is the only one of its kind. If there are others, I'd welcome the chance to find out who's doing them. Uh, because I think this is something that is probably beneficial, especially to students, graduate students, who are looking at uh, political science, looking at foreign affairs, looking at defense policy. I think they're very eye-opening and beneficial. Great. Um, and uh, sorry, just an earlier question. I'm kind of hopping around the questions, but I, I promise all the participants I will get to them. Okay. Um, uh, and again, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but Hiro Akutsu asked, uh, as for behavior, what are your assumptions about signaling in your game? Um, like what, you know, what has worked with Russia may not work with China and vice versa. Uh, is he talking about the U.S. and Soviet game that I've just been talking about? Is that? Right, right. Yeah, it was from earlier in your presentation. Okay. In other words, what, what accounts for their behavior? Is that what he's asking? I believe so, right. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a come as you are thing. Uh, we had no illusions about the fact that in an actual nuclear exchange, you wouldn't have a chance to prepare yourself for it. You would get tapped on the shoulder and you would get hijacked to a location and uh, you would be find yourself sitting in the driver's seat with a bunch of other people dealing with what is. Um, the major advantage, as I said at the outset, to these games is that the more people played these games, they had a keener appreciation of what you could learn by losing as well as what you could learn by winning. And they also discovered there was a third reality, which is nobody wins and nobody loses. And that reality hit people, I think, pretty hard. Especially when you consider this, and that is in a nuclear exchange, it's hard to find people who are waving a flag and jumping for joy and saying that was terrific. And I know um, <clears throat> Evan had a, a question that was kind of leapfrogging off of that was, um, did people ever try and kind of reject the base scenarios of the game, just given the horrific nature of what was being simulated with, with nuclear weapons? And well, they, they could. They were allowed as human beings to, to fight the scenario, but uh, if that continued past the first two hours of the game, they were very politely removed and replaced where we could. Okay. Um, and I know we had, we had a request from uh, one of the participants. Um, uh, could you go to the last slide? Just I know some people were interested in, in reaching out um, because I believe they had your contact information. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, and and uh, uh, we have another question from I'll do from uh, Ali Khan, which was the cost of removing the U.S. government from power would be so high from uh, Russia and China that they would continue to coexist with the U.S. I think you kind of touched on that with the. Um, you may not have uh, kind of situations at the end that are at the extremes. It may just kind of be maintaining. Um, and so Ali asked, could, can that theory apply to other nuclear powers, right? Could other nations raise the costs so high that the U.S. will just tolerate them? Well, uh, I'm going to 
take a, a fairly wide scope interpretation of that question because one of the things I did not expressly include in my briefing were other forms of nuclear attack which could be provocative enough to be seen as a um, bloody nose gesture, if you will, to start a nuclear war. One of them is an EMP attack, that is electromagnetic pulse. And one of the concerns we had about North Korea was that North Korea could fire a missile with no intention of having that missile land on the United States in any one of our 50 states. And fire a missile at two or three or maybe five miles into the atmosphere, have it explode exoatmospheric, and the umbrella of radiation and the umbrella of geomagnetic disturbance that that would generate would fry just about everything electronic you can think of under its penumbra. Now, if somebody were to do that, a nuclear state with five or six weapons, do that on an enemy, we would consider that a decapitation strike because what you'd be doing is you'd be destroying the livelihood, the economic well-being of a nation. And the issuance of radiation, ironically, would not kill very many people, not initially, it would kill them long-term with radiation, but it would completely inflict economic damage on the target. It remains a concern not only for us, but for all of the other nuclear states I've mentioned, that a EMP decapitation strike remains a risk. And we cannot really get away from that. The second degree problem is somebody through terrorism or subterfuge blows up a major nuclear plant, releasing enough radiation like Chernobyl to make the area within 15 or 20 miles around that nuclear plant uh, uninhabitable for 20 or 25 years. That act of terrorism, that act of sabotage could result in a nuclear response if people felt it was a, uh, a cheap way of achieving a uh, limited strike victory. Those are the only two I can think of, Grant. I don't know if any of these answer people's questions. I'll just assume that they do. No, I, I think they do. And, and people have been uh, fairly responsive in the comment sections. Um, so it, uh, you, just, you just had at least one thumbs up. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, for participants, if you do have kind of clarifying questions, feel free to just toss them in the chat. Um, but yeah, I think uh, to the extent that you have been, you know, able to answer the questions. Yeah, I, I think it's been very helpful. Um, okay. I'll do uh, one or two more and then I actually have to uh, step off. I have um, a separate interview, but uh, the Georgetown um, University of War Game Society Vice President Robert Copes uh, is uh, here to swap in my place. So I will hand the reins to him in, in just a second or two. Um, uh, so, um, and I know we had a, a question or two about uh, kind of the human participants and that you said sometimes you had to remove them. Um, uh, Christopher Lawrence had asked, how honestly do you feel that participants were engaging in the war games, right? So in a way that reasonably reflects how they would actually act under real circumstances. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, that's one of the reasons why the burden was on us as the exercise designers and controllers to make it as realistic and high pressure as possible. Because if they couldn't stand a stim simulated environment, they couldn't handle a real crisis environment. So it was in our interest and in their interest to remove them from among the team of potential leaders who would be involved in this exercise. Uh, there is always a gap between the way people behave in an exercise and the way people behave in reality. It's one thing, of course, to watch a war movie and people fighting with sabers or shooting guns at each other and dropping bombs. It's another thing to be in an actual combat situation. The things you do and you don't do have 
true life and death consequences. I don't think anyone knows it comes down to the individual how you're going to behave in a in a crisis, high demand environment where uh, your ability to make a good decision uh, affects not only you but many other people as well. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll do I'll do one more again before I, I hand it off. And just to note, uh, Sebastian, can we just make sure that um, Robert uh, uh, Robert Kobsa has the uh, co co-host capabilities? Um, yeah, sure, I got it. Perfect, thank you. Um, and uh, I know we had a, a couple questions, um, just kind of generally on on if there's any books that you would uh, recommend on on nuclear war or nuclear war gaming. Well. Uh, there's actually a tremendous number of books that have been written out there. Um, the uh, the ones that I can think of. Let me just uh, let me just grab two or three off my bookshelf. Hold me. Let me hold you one second while I do that. Probably the two, uh, there's many others, but the two that I'd recommend, which have been around a while by Graham Allison, The Essence of Decision, which deals with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, Dealing with the Dirty War by Jim Dunnigan is another one which talks about um, wargaming. Jim was one of the architects along with some of us who did these games. Um, there's not a lot written that I'm aware of by people who um, have done these things in, in real life, who've put pen to paper and written a lot about it. I think that one of the things that's missing, in my opinion, one of the things that's missing in graduate school discussion of this, of this subject is the ability to replicate uh, the kind of higher order decisions in crisis that one has to encounter. I also do uh, games for emergency managers and crisis managers in a different incarnation. And I do it because of the same dynamics that arose in the last question you raised, which is uh, you, you exercises help people learn how they will make decisions in under duress and, and with a great deal of pressure. Exercises, as far as I'm concerned, are worth their weight in gold because nobody dies, but they prepare you for the time when you have to sit in the chair and make a decision where somebody could die. And I'd rather have somebody who went through a series of exercises. And as far as you know, from looking at Bloom's taxonomy, this is after all the highest level of learning experientially that you can in, be involved in an educational si situation other than doing the actual job itself. And so the better designed exercise, the more realistic it is, the more uh, dilemmas it puts you in, the more decisions it forces you to make, the better it is. And it's probably one of my great criticisms of universities today is that they don't put the graduate students who are able and bright into enough exercises to help them understand the dynamics of decision making, the dilemmas, the problems, the blind spots, the biases that operate when you have to operate under crisis. Um, hi, Robert. So uh, as, as Grant said uh, previously, I'm the, the vice president of the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, uh, also Robert. Uh, but at this point, I'm going to take over for him uh, with asking questions. So um, he's caught me up to speed. Um, to him and then to the audience at large, um, if there are any questions that you, you think that I've forgotten or maybe have asked that have already been asked, feel free to let me know. 
Um, but other than that, to the audience, continue to um, continue to contribute questions to the uh, to the chat. Um, with that, Robert, uh, our next question is: What is a realistic element of nuclear war games that is most misrepresented or ill executed in your experience? Misrepresented or ill executed? Well. <laughs> We know from some interesting discussions that we had uh, that the Russians did some similar things that we were doing, that they involved their leadership in nuclear war gaming. But what we don't know is the extent to which uh, people use this to train their leaders. I guess the way I'm going to approach the question is sometimes you encounter people who are in leadership positions that believe there's nothing you can do to teach them anything new. And so they'll resist an exercise where they may make a mistake or they may make an error in judgment or they may not do a four star job and they don't want to risk the embarrassment of that, of that being seen by other people. And the no fault character of this exercise in building confidence, leadership about how to deal with difficult situations is what it's all about. Was there a part of the question I'm, I still need to answer? No, I, I think that covers it. Okay. Um, so next question here. Um, in your opinion, what are we supposed to do uh, with regard to, and, and you can kind of integrate this into to how you view it from a game design perspective, what do we do um, concerning uh, Russia's recent development of non-strategic nuclear weapons? Uh, they're, they're sort of novel non-strategic uh, nu uh, nuclear, or excuse me, non-nuclear strategic weapons, and how that might play into this dynamic. Well, <clears throat> as I said during the briefing, <clears throat> uh, woe unto you trying to design a nuclear crisis game based on 2020 circumstances. Uh, part of this would require from a realism standpoint that you have a realistic sense of what's in the Russian arsenal, that you know what hypersonic weapons can do, what you know what its most advanced nuclear torpedo can do, what you know what its most advanced road and, and rail mobile missiles can do. Uh, all those things would be absolute basic ingredients for the opposing force. And by the same token, you'd have to know what China's capabilities would be, what North Korea's capabilities would be, and so on. And uh, this also assumes that you have a, a full understanding of what the US has within its arsenal. Because one would assume, again, in a nuclear crisis, do or die situation, the leadership would not be ignorant of the different toys and the different buttons they could push. So that, that's my attempt to answer that question. And another question we have that's kind of a natural transition of that is, could you speak to just kind of some of the other factors in addition to that, adding to this um, complexity, maybe in, in a modern nuclear war. So factors such as space and cyber, um, as well as the way that from the Russian and Chinese perspective, um, how they would use non-strategic nuclear weapons to achieve tactical wins. Right. Well, you've mentioned cyber, for example, that would be one. Uh, there's directed energy, which is another. There is uh, nano neurobiological uh, instruments. There are elements of synthetic biology. Uh, there are future generations of chemical warfare. Uh, I could go on and on, but if you wanted to add a lot of rich context to your contemporary game, again, the primary task for you to make it as realistic as possible is to know the genuine capabilities of all the competing sides so that everyone knew what was on their dashboard and what its capabilities were. And especially, thinking beyond that, especially what your defensive capabilities are against what the opponent's arsenal includes. <clears throat> 
Thank you for the, for the response. Um, so another uh, question about gameplay elements. Um, did you ever add an unattributable nuclear burst to gameplay? In other words, a random nuclear burst, we don't know who did it? Yes, un unattributable nuclear burst. Yeah. Well, of course, during the period I'm talking about, those eight years I'm talking about, that wouldn't have been possible. Um, while China theoretically had nuclear weapons, um, and certainly while Britain and France had nuclear weapons, uh, the, the idea of, gee, who just fired that nuke is very unlikely to happen, barring the scenarios I talked about, which is somebody blows up a nuclear plant releasing radiation, or someone fires a lone missile into the air for the purpose of EMP. Now, one thing I did not discuss, because we'd like to believe they don't exist anymore, uh, during the 80s, uh, the Russian Minister of Defense, uh, uh, Ivanovich Libid, uh, General Libid, uh, visited the United States, and I was his escort. And General Lebed was the advisor to President Yeltsin. And when Lebed was elevated to the position of advisor to Yeltsin, one of the first things he wanted to do was to account for something called ADMs. These are atomic demolition munitions. These are tactical nuclear weapons the size of a backpack that were distributed to Spetsnaz, that is Special Operations Russian Forces to infiltrate uh, to different Western targets at different times. And the story is basically this, that when uh, Lebed was asked by Yeltsin to, uh, to account, provide full nuclear accountability as best as Lebed could determine, and he briefed the US Congress on this, as best as Lebed could determine, there were 58 atomic demolition munitions in the possession of the Russian, I mean, the Soviet troops. Lebed could only account for 30 of them. And that created a, a consternation and a worry. And there were a lot of direct discussions between our president and Yeltsin at the time to find out where the heck these missing things were. And I only mention that because it's a, it's a wild card in terms of the context of the question, because tactical nuclear weapons are, are, have been, are now, and always will be a wild card. Tactical nuclear weapons are low yield weapons, of, of, almost of the variety of the kind used on Hiroshima in 45, uh, but they're still deadly, they still kill people, but they're tiny and they're used, as they said, tactically for effect. So that's the only way that I could consider a random nuclear event happening in the context of the eight years of our games. It was inconceivable that a random nuclear event could happen except for an ADM and an EMP strike. Um, so next more to your experience using uh, these games or their applicability. Um, what was the primary purpose of these games? Uh, for instance, experiential, training, testing, uh, or exploratory? Uh, or do different games have different primary purposes? All the games that we did were, had three purposes. That was to train senior leadership teams for the task. Number two, it was to build skills in crisis management. And number three, it was to acquaint them with and equip them for a variety of nuclear conflict scenarios that to the best of our judgment were likely to happen. Excellent. Um, so at this point, um, it seems that we uh, have gone through most of our, or I believe all of our questions here. Um, we'll give everybody in the, in the audience here, I just uh, asked the group if anybody has uh, any additional questions to ask. So uh, we'll give them a few, a minute or two here. Um, but with that, uh, my understanding is, is, is we've had a really good discussion here today, um, and I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, excuse me. Um, 
let's see. Oh, yeah. So how well do you think the games did uh, in terms of achieving those goals of the working, uh, those you were just speaking to? In my own opinion, my own humble personal opinion, I think uh, it was better that we did those things than not do those things. I'd hate to see people plunged into that crisis without any preparation, without any awareness, without any knowledge of how things could go. So I, I have one final question for you. Um, will I be able to get access to this recording that you made? Yep. Yeah, yeah, most certainly. Oh, go ahead, Sebastian. No, I was going to say yes. Uh, the recording will be on our YouTube page prior to tomorrow morning. Okay. So, Sebastian, is there anything else you'd like me to talk about or any other questions I should try to address? Hey, Robert, there's some other questions in the chat. Yeah, just seeing those come in here. So we actually have a couple more questions here. If, uh, if Robert, if you uh, still want to take the time to answer these last few. Sure, go ahead. Perfect. Um, so is this kind of board gaming being done today uh, as an ongoing activity? If it was, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> um, and then additionally, uh, do you have more or less confidence in our nuclear decision makers before or after the war games from your experience? Or did you have more or less confidence? Well, having witnessed just about all of these games over that eight year period, I came away convinced that we were very wise at that time. Hey, uh, Robert, you, you faded out. Can you start over again? Yeah. Having been involved in most of the games over the eight year period, I came away with a conclusion. It was better to, for us to have done this and given these people the taste of what could happen than to not have done it at all. Gotcha. Um, so I think we had one other person requesting um, if you could go back to your contact info slide um, and hold on that. I think some folks wanted to get some information from that. Oh, excellent. Perfect. Okay. Well, again, um, just on behalf of the Georgetown University War Gaming Society, um, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to spend your evening with us uh, and, and sharing this information, um, as well as, as uh, stimulating a great discussion. Um, as always, want to thank the folks uh, who came and attended this evening. Um, and everybody that contributed contributed questions uh, to facilitate our discussion here, um, which as always, um, I'm always amazed by the, the depth uh, and breadth of questions that, that people offer here that, that really give us a rich discussion that I think is one of the best parts of, of our webinars. Um, so again, Robert, uh, thank you. And if you have any uh, final words, I'll, um, I'll let you have it. Uh, just a few words. Thank you again for the uh, opportunity to talk about these things. And as I mentioned before, while these are locked in the past, going back almost 40 years. Uh, we still face many of the same considerations, many of the same challenges, uh, many of the same uncertainties, if not 10 times more, literally, than we faced back then. And I hope that the uh, people participating in this understand that uh, an exercise, a series of exercises of this nature can only give you a glimpse a much better glimpse than without it, but it can only give you a glimpse of what it's like to uh, sit in the chair and make these decisions and know that uh, there are real, genuine life and death consequences of those decisions. So thanks again.